Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're so happy that you've tuned in to be a part of this. We are thrilled that we have some guest speakers for our class tonight. But before we turn things over to them, uh, for our third through sixth graders, we've been asking you to kind of tell someone, tell your parents, tell somebody in your home, what do you know about some certain things? And uh, tonight it's about the 12 sons of Jacob. So what are three things that you know about the 12 sons of Jacob? Share that with somebody in your home and uh, and go look that up and read about the 12 sons of Jacob tonight. Uh, we are excited about the opportunity that we have tonight. Alan Compton, Larry Wilson, Derek Pig, and Terrell Phillips are here to share with you guys some verses and some thoughts to encourage you, the church. And uh, we're very, very happy to be able to, to bring this to you and uh, hope that it is uplifting and encouraging to you. So we'll turn things over to Alan as we get started tonight. Okay, so when I think about some verses, uh, a passage that gives me great encouragement and, and joy, really, even, uh, I think about Philippians chapter 2. And so uh, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Philippians 2. We want to look at a few, pass- a few verses there and uh, just make some comments there, and hopefully it will give us some good encouragement. So whenever we, we look and and study uh, a verse or a passage of verses. It's uh, the best way to get good context uh, of what's going on, what's being said, or why it's being said, is um, to really look at the surrounding verses. And if we can look at the, read the whole book, that would be the best scenario. So if you have time tonight, today, go ahead and read the whole book of Philippians. You can do it in one sitting pretty easily. Um, but well, we won't do that now. But if we do look at, at chapter 1, um, it, if you read through that chapter, it's really difficult to miss the uh, obvious and sincere appreciation and love that Paul has for uh, the church there at Philippi. He prays for them always. He, he longs to be with them again. Uh, he expresses joy that they remain faithful and are still, um, um, still faithful to Christ, still preaching and teaching about Christ. And he also encourages them um, despite their persecution and despite his persecution. Paul's writing this letter from prison. And uh, we look down in verse 28. We can pick up there as he is about to get on into chapter 2. So verse 28, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Paul writes, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. So when we think about the privilege of, of uh, trusting in Christ, you know, and, and that, that's what that is. It's a privilege that, that we have come to the knowledge of Christ. And, and Paul understood that, and, and he was trying to encourage the, the church in Philippi to understand that as well. And to also look at the suffering of Christ as, as a privilege, you know, Anything like that where we're suffering, where we're being persecuted, uh, we hear about stories like that and we think it is so uh, devastating, we think it as negative, and, and it can be viewed that way. But Paul's trying to, to encourage us to look at it in a positive light and to look at it as a badge of honor that you um, were uh, privileged enough to be able to suffer for the case of Christ. And so he's encouraging them through that. And then he says, we're in this struggle together, which is a statement we kind of are familiar with now. We've heard from time to time, if you listen to the radio, you hear commercials with companies trying to, uh, trying to uh, communicate that message that we're in this together uh, through this co- coronavirus pandemic. And, and what they're trying to do is to somehow establish a relationship, uh, a connection with us, knowing that we're going through tough times together. And, but Paul here and, and the church there definitely were going through tough times together. 
you know, they did struggle together. When one was hurting, the other one would hurt. They felt that. They knew that. And when Paul was in prison here, uh, they were praying for him. They were caring for him. They were supporting him uh, in, in all kinds of different ways. And so um, and Paul then continues that thought on into chapter 2. Uh, and he, he does that by asking some rhetorical questions. He, he says, uh, starts off, and, and, and as we read, we maybe have read these questions before and we don't put much thought into them because they are easy to answer. We're, 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 we're Christians, we're Christ followers, so when we read these questions, we answer, oh yeah, that's, that's true, yes. But I, what I want us to do is look at some of these questions and really think about them. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? So we think about how Jesus paid for us uh, as, as a ransom. Uh, he, he bought us, he purchased us with his own life. And, and so that should give us great encouragement knowing that, that we belong to Christ. We are his. And then he asks, is there any comfort from his love? So when I think about that question, I, it makes me think about my kids and, um, you know, think about them being outside, playing outside, and one of them may fall and get hurt. Or um, one may push the other for some reason. They might get into it, and one of them gets their feelings hurt or may be physically hurt from that. And what's the first thing they do? They, they run to Lauren or myself, to mom or daddy, and they want to feel loved. They want to be comforted. And that's really, there's no better way for those kids uh, to be comforted than to that, have that physical embrace by mom or dad. And to be told, look, you're going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be, you're going to be fine. And, and really, as adults, we're, we're kind of the same way when we go through difficult times. Um, when, you know, maybe we're in physical pain, uh, but maybe it's emotional pain. Uh, maybe we're going through financial struggles or, um, you know, emotional problems. Uh, maybe it's family issues. Uh, maybe it's a sickness or, or death that we're struggling with. Uh, but nothing gives us much, uh, nothing gives us more comfort than knowing that uh, someone loves us. Now, people, you know, other people, other, you know, church brothers and sisters and uh, maybe friends or family. But knowing that somebody loves us and cares about us uh, really gives us comfort, doesn't it? And uh, uh, but especially knowing that, that Christ loves us and, and that God loves us, um, that gives us great comfort. So Paul asked that question, is there any comfort from his love? Yes. Any, any fellowship together in the spirit? And so that's something all of us long for is fellowship. It's something that we, we kind of miss now, right, uh, in a way. So we, we, we look at, uh, we think about fellowship meals, and we think about fellowship as being together and enjoying one another's company. Um, but when we look at that word fellowship, um, and we look at the Greek word for that, uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but it's something like uh, koinonia. And in the first century, uh, uh, folks understood that, that word koinonia, meaning partnership or participation with, um, working together to it for a common goal, toward a common goal, right? And so uh, Paul uses this word fellowship um, through uh, in different forms, that koinonia in different forms throughout the book of Philippians. And, um, and what he means by that is that, yeah, that they're having fellowship, they're having a partnership together. That's what he's trying to uh, convey there. So it is the Spirit working within us, uh, within them, to achieve that partnership, to achieve that participation that, um, toward a, a common goal. So if those first three questions there are answered yes, then that fourth one is answered yes too probably. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Uh, then, then that would probably be a yes as well. And so um, throughout the rest uh, of this chapter, Paul pleads for unity and love, and he expounds on it uh, th through the next few verses there. Um, verse 3, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. 
thinking of others as better than yourselves. Um, don't lo look out for your own, only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. And so Lauren and I have really tried to um, have that principle in the forefront of our, of our marriage, uh, you know, to, to put one another's interest above our own. If I put Lauren's interest in, uh, above mine and she puts uh, my interest above hers, um, then, then we're both, our, both of our joy is going to be fulfilled. We'll, we'll, we'll both be happy and things are going to work out a little bit easier uh, for us in that. And I think that can be applied to a lot of things in life, but especially with the church. You know, if we put other people's needs and interests above our own, um, then, then we'll be working together a lot more effectively and efficiently. And, and then Paul explains that Jesus set that example in verses 5 through 11. Um, he says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's the gospel in a nutshell. Really, that's a good summary of the story of Jesus, the Son of God uh, becoming Son of Man, uh, and, and you know, going living life as a human, going through the same difficulties and challenges that we go through, but yet without sin and uh, without transgressing the law. And despite that, taking on sin and dying a, a humiliating and, and torturous death uh, of a criminal. And, and why? Why did he do that? Well, it's, it's so he could be with his people for eternity. And so he was raised the third day and then glorified by God the Father, um, and now he sits on the throne with him. So, uh, what an example. And, and, and how, how will we, how will you tomorrow put others first? How will you follow Jesus' exam, example on that? How will you partner with, with others in the church to accomplish the same goal? And that, and that goal is really um, teaching that message that we just heard. Uh, of, of the story of Jesus. So it, despite our physical distance right now, we can still fellowship with one another because we can partner with each other in that, having that same goal. We can participate with each other in that, in Christ. And hopefully real soon, uh, we'll be able to uh, demonstrate that fellowship by being together again and enjoying each other's company. And so I hope this has been an encouragement to you as it has to me. Thanks, Alan. I uh, really appreciate that lesson and the partnership. This is Larry, and it reminds me of what I've been missing for so many weeks, that partnership that we had with, with all of our brothers and sisters. We miss you so much. Melody sends her love, and... Um, we are just counting down days to when we can get back together and fellowship together. And, and uh, Alan, we thank you so much for just reminding us of that, that um, partnership that we have together. Scott asked uh, several weeks ago about uh, favorite passages, favorite verses that we might have, and to expand on them. And I have so many, and, and they change. They change weekly. They change daily. They change um, by whatever you are going through in your life. And so tonight I've chosen uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's the story of David and Goliath. 
and you're already thinking, Larry, this is this is kid story stuff. This is this is uh, VBS. We we learned this a long time ago, and and uh, we already know the story of David and Goliath. Uh, kids' bedtime Bible story, but it's one that is very applicable to us, and especially at at this time in our lives, in everybody's lives. We know the story of David and Goliath and what happened to the young man David and, and just a shepherd boy at the time. And he comes into a battle that he knows uh, very little about. And we are facing those times ourselves we have been thrown into a battle that that we have no clue about we don't know what's going to happen but because of David and his faith in God he was able to take control of that battle and and conquer it in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 47 it says then all this Assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, I know this is David and Goliath, and I know this is the, the young shepherd boy David, and, and, and the one that grew up to be the king and great conqueror, and and um, one of the greatest kings of all times. But the Lord has said to us that the battle is his. And so many times in my life I forget. I forget about that. And I am out there fighting tooth and nail uh, for something that I need, I need to very simply give give God uh, he wants to have that control for all of our our frontline people out there that that are working themselves to death they've got battles of their own that they're facing and from doctors to nurses to therapists to um, all those that 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 come in contact with this virus firsthand we say thank you and we understand that you are you are going through a battle that that you've never seen before and and I just want to remind you that the battle belongs to the Lord all those volunteers out there we have we have volunteers in our cities that that actually volunteered to to face this crisis head on and we appreciate y'all so much but we know that you're in a battle of your own for the parents out there that are not used to having their children 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're used to having schools open, and and now they have a battle of their own, those parents taking care of their children. And I remind you that the battle belongs to the Lord. The teachers, they sit down in the morning and eat their breakfast And they think about little Scott or little Susie, little Pam, that may not be sitting down and, and eating their breakfast because they, they have no breakfast. Or maybe, maybe they're, both their parents are essential workers and, and both their parents are gone and they, they have to be there. And those teachers are worried sick about their students. There's many people that have lost income 
lost their jobs. And they have a different battle to overcome. But I want you to know that, that you need to give God all these things. And he can conquer. He can conquer. We have entered a totally different uh, life the last few weeks. One that we have never seen before and hope that we never see again. We've got seniors that are not able to graduate. We've got ball players that are not able to play ball. We've got coaches that are not able to coach. Um, I just listened to the news just a few minutes ago and, and, and they said that addictions are on the rise alcohol sales are are more than they have ever been um, depression suicide all those things all those evils i just want you to rem to remind you if you're going through anything like that remember that the lord is there and he cares for you and and he wants to take this suffering from you But not only him, but the church also. We are here for you, and we care for you, and and we want to to help in any way that we can. First Peter five and verse seven. Peter saying, "For the Lord, he says, cast all your burdens, cast all your cares, cast." everything all your battles on me on him on god because he cares for you if you think that no one else does god cares for you and he wants to fight the battle for you sawyer my oldest grandson came up to me just two or three days ago and and he was standing right in front of me. I could not walk around him. I could not go around him. He, he was right in front of me, and he had his hands held high. You know exactly what he wanted. He wanted to be picked up. And it's times like this that we want the same thing. We stand in front of God. We hold our hands high. And we ask and we plead and we pray and we pray. God, just pick us up, care for us, love us, take these burdens away. Thank y'all so much for listening. Good evening. So thankful for the, uh, the words that Alan and Larry have shared with us already tonight. This is Derek, and uh, like the others had mentioned, uh, Scott had asked us to, to share one of our favorite verses. And as Larry mentioned, that's something that changes. It changes over time. And so I've had many different favorite verses uh, throughout my life. Uh, but there was one specific one that I wanted to share with you tonight. And that's in Exodus chapter 14. We'll get there in just a moment. But to get to this verse, we've got to set the stage a little bit, if you will. And think about what was going on just before Exodus chapter 14. Now you know how God sent the ten plagues on Egypt to set his people free. How that Pharaoh, time after time, was about to let the people go and then would harden his heart and then call them back and not let them go until that tenth plague. That tenth plague when the angel of death came there at the Passover and took all those of the firstborn who had not followed the words of God through the mouth of Moses and all those that had lost those firstborn. And so Pharaoh lets these people go. He doesn't want to see them anymore. He tells them to get out. And so they're leaving Egypt. And they're on their way to the wilderness. Now they're being led by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. A pillar of cloud by day 
a pillar of fire by night. They've seen the ten plagues. They've seen the power of God firsthand. And as they approach the Red Sea, they begin to see a cloud of dust behind them. And they see this cloud of dust behind them, and it's approaching, and they know that Pharaoh has come back. He's come back to get them. Their hearts are filled with fear. Their hearts are filled with doubt. We read in Exodus chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, that they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we might serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They thought it was over. They thought they were going to die right there. Now, we know different because we know the rest of the story. But they thought that they were going to die. They had no hope. You see, these people had forgotten that God had made them more than conquerors. These people were slaves when Moses came to them in Egypt. When God sent Moses into Egypt to bring his people out, his people were slaves. And they came out with gold and jewelry from the Egyptians. They came out with animals, all these herds and flocks. God had made them more than conquerors. They had seen the power of God firsthand in the plagues. They had seen the Nile turn to blood. They had seen the frogs. They had seen all of these plagues. They had seen the pillar of cloud that would lead them by day. And they would see the pillar of fire by night. This wasn't some rinky-dink flashlight out in the middle of the desert. This was providing enough light that they could travel by night for this many people. The fact that there was a pillar of fire would have been an amazing thing, but the fact that they were being led by a pillar of fire, that it was leading them where they needed to go, is miraculous. They saw all of this firsthand, yet they forgot that God had made them more than conquerors. And then this is my favorite verse, or one of my favorites. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now we know what happened after this, that Moses by the power of God, would part the Red Sea as he stretched his staff over the Red Sea, that God would part that, that he would dry the land, and that he would also cause a separation to come in between the armies of Israel and the armies of Egypt, that he would keep his people safe, that he would bring them safely through the Red Sea, get them onto the other side, and wait until their enemies were in the midst of the Red Sea to allow it to crash upon them. We know that. But before Moses stretched his staff over the Red Sea, those people didn't know that. They didn't know what was going to happen. They were afraid. They thought they were going to die. Now, it's, it's easy for us to, to look at these people, the people of Israel in, here in Exodus chapter 14, and think, how could you not know that God was going to take care of you? How could you not know that God, after he had done all this for you, that he was going to see you over to the other side. But yet, don't we oftentimes forget ourselves? I know that I do. We forget the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8. We forget the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, 
nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We see God working in our lives. We've experienced the love of God, and yet when problems come, we often, I do, often forget that God has made me more than a conqueror. That he has shown his love to me through the death of his son. I don't know about you, but this is an amazing encouragement to me to know that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. I hope that you have obeyed the gospel, and I hope that you know that you cannot be separated from the love of God. If you don't know what that means to obey the gospel, then I, I hope that you will speak with someone. I hope that you will speak with someone here and help let us study the Bible with you and talk more about that. But if you have obeyed the gospel, remember that you have been made more than a conqueror. And it's not by anything that we have done, any good deed or anything like that. It's because of the love of God and what his son was willing to do for us in our obedience to that, that God has made us more than conquerors. The Israelites had forgotten. They had forgotten that God had made them, had taken them as slaves and made them more than conquerors. In the same way, we who were slaves of sin have been made more than conquerors by God. Hey everyone, it's Terrell Phillips. Uh, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 uh, may sound a little familiar to you if you were tuned in Sunday morning uh, to Scott's lesson. He did a great job uh, working through 1 John chapter 4 into 1 John chapter 5 and covered a lot of this. Uh, this verse in particular has, has resonated with me for quite a while because of, of the simplicity and the reaffirmation of positivity. Uh, it's not as deep as that sounds, but it, it's just something that is really kind of reaffirming to me. In, in particular, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Now, really, to get the, the full concept, or, or more of the full concept, really to go into the entire full concept, you could go back and listen to Scott's uh, study from Sunday morning. Uh, but if we just back up to uh, ch uh, chapter 5 and verse 1 uh, there in 1 John. 1 John 5 and verse 1, and read those three verses together. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now part of what this uh, kind of means to me uh, or, or brings home to me is... Uh, in a modern day sense, that, that we really live in a rule-based society. We, we thrive on fairness. And that's from young to old. Uh, many of you have been, been spending a lot of time with your kids. If you have multiple kids, uh, it happens pretty regular. So-and-so is not sharing. She's not, she's not sharing her time. She won't play with me. He won't play with me. You get these things. Uh, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that. Kids at home, they want fairness. Adults are much the same way uh, in society as well. When it comes to business, when it comes to something as simple as, as driving down Highway 72 and somebody passes us going 58 miles an hour and you look over and you say, they fisting to get a ticket. We thrive on fairness. We want to see others that are doing things uh, the right way, doing things the way they're supposed to be done. We get focused on the do-nots in life. Uh, 
and and when you look at the ministry of Jesus, much of what the Pharisees came at Jesus with were the do nots. Uh, don't heal on the Sabbath. Uh, don't eat with unclean hands. Don't eat with Zacchaeus. He's a sinner. One of the things that, that this uh, verse in particular brings home to me is that we need to focus on the do's. Now, when we look at verse 3 and, and we see that his commandments are not burdensome, often when we think the word uh, commandments, it, it makes you think of the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm, I'm not in any way belittling the fact that there are necessary do-nots. Uh, certainly, there are warnings uh, throughout the entire uh, New Testament and going back to the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament as well that are, are very vital warnings of do not. When you look at the Ten Commandments, eight of the ten, I guess, are are do nots that are directly from God. So, in no way belittling the need for there to be do nots. But when we look at the word commandment when it was presented to Jesus, we can go to Matthew chapter twenty-two and verse thirty-six. In Matthew chapter twenty-two and verse thirty-six, the Pharisees came to him uh, testing him. Matthew 22 and verse 36, one of them, a lawyer, says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus says to him in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It was not a do not when Jesus was approached with that question. Both of those commandments were do's. And I think that what really drives home and, and, and kind of marries this section of Matthew chapter 22 with the text that, that I was discussing there in 1 John chapter 5 is that verse 40. And I, I believe we overlook it often when we look at this section uh, of Jesus' response when he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you can get these two things right, do these two things, and everything else will fall into place. If you're doing these two things, the do-nots aren't that difficult. If you're loving God, you're following what he says. If you're loving your neighbor, you're doing right by man, the rest is pretty easy. Loving your neighbor, that's a lot of what we read in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Love the children of God, that's loving your neighbor. So what does love do to your neighbor? Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 10 says, Love does no harm to your neighbor, but is a fulfillment of the law. So you may not have to love everyone. Well, we say it. Uh, saying it is easy. Living it is a challenge. It's kind of a tough love moment. Uh, tough love, we often think of tough love in the terms of discipline or rehabilitation or correction. Tough love is loving someone that's hard to love. Are others tough to love really because of them or because of ourselves? It's a necessary reflection to look at ourselves to realize if it's hard to love others because of the way that we are ourselves. Uh, there's a quote uh, that, that may be attributed to several different authors or, or historical figures that, that roughly says, the man that will cause me the most trouble in a day's time, I stare at in the mirror every morning. So we cause ourselves a lot of our own trouble and we may cause ourselves to be not only tough to love, but cause ourselves to have difficulty in loving others. Are you easy to love? Are you alert to the situation of others? Are you aware of others' needs? Being aware can really enlighten you to the needs of others. Awareness breeds compassion. Compassion breeds understanding. We have to be alert to others' needs. 
And really, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3 encompasses that entire thing. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We'll close this evening with a prayer. Thank you all for, t for tuning in. And want to also thank the elders of this congregation and our ministers and staff for the, uh, the great job that they're doing of trying to find ways to help keep us united, keep us uh, together. And we all look forward to being together at a, at a moment in the near future. Let's bow together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, a time that we can spend together looking into your word. We thank you for the opportunities that you put in our lives to do good to others and for others. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be alert and wise to those moments and do what you would have us to do in those times. We thank you most of all for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross and help us to never take that sacrifice for granted and help us to always be the light that you want us to be in the dark world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.